we have someone who has just vanished. She never came back to retrieve her car. And the next morning, she didn't show up for work. We felt like this may not turn out to be an overdue hiker. Something might have happened to Meredith. Witnesses had observed her with a strange man. I thought I knew what evil was. He's pure evil. You look into his eyes, you could tell that Satan was running his soul. It was a perfect way to ring in the new year. 24-year-old Meredith Emerson and her beloved dog, Ella, would take a hike up Blood Mountain in Georgia. However, a walk in the woods would take a horrible turn. I'm Paul Holes, and this is Real Life Nightmare. I think about this case every day. It just won't go away. We kind of go through our careers thinking, you know, we're bulletproof. We're a Teflon. These things don't get to us. And yet, it did. She was such a good person, and this didn't need to happen to her. Meredith Emerson was a 24-year-old, vivacious young woman. She came here to go to school at the University of Georgia, where she majored in French. She had lots of friends. She had a roommate, she had a boyfriend, and she had a black lab mix named Ella. And the picture that, that you see of her most often is her with the diploma from Doggy Training School with Ella. And she adored that dog. Very outgoing, very intelligent, very strong, avid hiker. She was studying martial arts. She was very good at it. She loved to get away and hike on the Appalachian Trail. Just a young woman that everybody loved and wanted to be around. On January 1st, 2008, Meredith was supposed to hang out with her boyfriend. But they had had a phone conversation and she felt that he was a little snippy, so instead of hanging with him, she and Ella headed up to um, Blood Mountain, which is a, a, an approach trail to the Appalachian Trail. It's very popular and it's beautiful. The Blood Mountain Approach Trail is probably one of the most recognized hiking destinations in, in Georgia and the Southeast. Meredith came to that parking lot and began to hike up the trail. And on January that day, it was probably mid to low 50s, bright sunshine. It was a good day to go hiking. Meredith Emerson failed to come home that night. Nobody knew anything about it until her employer called her roommate the following day and said she didn't make it to work. Her friend, Julia, with whom she lived, did get concerned on uh, January 2nd. Meredith and her dog were not there. Often uh, the dog would wake up both of them in the mornings. This isn't normal for Meredith. She always shows up for work. Nobody knew, none of her friends knew where she had gone. She left a note on a chalkboard in her apartment uh, going hiking with Ella, uh, but she didn't say where. When Aunt Meredith's friends were trying to decide what to do, they uh, looked at a guide, a hiking guide that she had where she had marked up some of her favorite trails, and one of them was Blood Mountain. So they went there, and it was the boyfriend that found her car parked at the trailhead. And it was covered with snow, because that night the temperatures dropped down to single digits, and it snowed. Once he found the car, he ran up the mountain screaming and yelling for her. He called all their friends. They amassed a large number of people to come up there and start searching. He actually left a note on her car that said, if you get back and you're here, please don't leave. We're looking for you. When it was first reported that Meredith Emerson was missing, the law enforcement response was enormous. We had helicopters, bloodhounds, cadaver dogs. People were volunteering to look for Meredith, and it was an intense search. 
at almost every turn, search teams would come back in and you could just see the, their faces and the disappointment that they were not able to find something. Late in the day on January 2nd, I get a call. Because of some things that were located on the trail, some water bottles, a dog leash, some dog treats, and a expandable police baton. Those items were found and turned in to law enforcement. But a police baton is, is unusual. That was the trigger uh, that the local law enforcement called my office to uh, get us to help. This is a, an expandable baton. Law enforcement used this to try and gain control of incompliant suspects. Opened in that fashion and it expands out. You rarely ever see this outside of law enforcement. It was part of my duty uh, to meet with the family, to give them information that we were learning. They're horrified. We felt like this may not turn out to be an overdue hiker, that something might have happened to Meredith. The first thing that we learned from her phone records, she apparently cut her phone off. So people trying to call her, going straight to voicemail, no contact. We actually had reached out to Meredith's bank and whether it had been a computer malfunction or whatever, unbeknownst to us, her ATM card was used. It was used by somebody that was concealing their face, hiding their face, and putting in wrong PIN numbers. You couldn't really see who it was. The image was not sharp, but you could tell that someone was using the ATM and it was kind of creepy. Her ATM card had actually been used on two separate occasions. One time in Blairsville, Georgia, which is just up the road from, from Blood Mountain. A second time in Gainesville, Georgia, south of Blood Mountain. All these were attempts. No money was gained. So he didn't get a dime. She's strong-willed. She's smart. And, and from what everybody's gathered is she knows, she knows these trails really well. Julia Karenbauer was her roommate. One thing that she did, she notified a lot of media. We immediately started getting calls into the tip line. Very important calls from people who had seen Meredith on the trail January 1st, but had also seen somebody with her that seemed like was following her and trying to engage her in conversation. All the descriptions matched. White male, weathered, toothless, and had a dog potentially named Danny and drove a white van. The thing that stuck out in my mind was is that he, he had a nice backpack, had a good looking dog, but he had duct tape on his shoes. They said they couldn't put their finger on what, what was wrong, but it just didn't feel right. We were actually able to talk to the gentleman who had found the baton. He said it looked like she was trying to get away from him. She was hiking faster than he was. He remembered noticing an area in one of the switchbacks on the trail where the ground had been disturbed. When he saw that area and then found the water bottles and the leash and the baton, he thought that it, a struggle might have happened there. In Georgia, they're stepping up the search now for a missing hiker. Police say they're looking for a man in his 60s who was seen talking to her on a trail. Everybody was broadcasting a description of this person and within minutes, they got a call from a man who once employed him. So I know who this is. I said, oh my God, this, this must be Gary Hilton. Tonight, the search for a missing female hiker in the North Georgia mountains and a person of interest. We began to get several phone calls to the tip line describing the man they saw walking with Meredith and trying to engage her in conversation. White male, weathered, toothless, had a dog, drove a white van. Very quickly we got a call from someone who essentially said, I know who you're looking for. I heard the description, I heard the location, Blood Mountain, which I knew was a frequent place that he visited. I put all that together and my heart just sunk to my stomach. I said, oh my God, this, this must be Gary Hilton. John Tabor said that he knew exactly who we were talking about. He says that he used to work for him as a telemarketer. He knew that he carried 
a police style baton. He said that his dog's not named Danny, it's Dandy. And that's why he knew that it was actually Gary Michael Hilton. Tabor said that he was a, a survivalist, he was a hiker, and he lived in the forest in his van. He had said that uh, Hilton liked to frequent national parks. He knows that he drives a white van because he bought it for him. He actually provided us with the tag number for the van. At that point, we were able to pull a driver's license photo of Gary Michael Hilton. Within minutes, they had a photograph of him, and it was blasted everywhere. We now have a name and a picture. They are looking for Gary Michael Hilton. He's 61 years old. One of the most unsettling details Tabor relayed to the GBI was the reason that Gary Michael Hilton was toothless is because he used a pair of pliers to pull out his own teeth. Because he felt like it made him look scarier, people wouldn't mess with him. All he'd have to do is grin real big with some sharp plucked teeth and people would leave him alone. There came a time where Hilton called Tabor. This was before everything started with Meredith Emerson and demanded an enormous amount of money. He threatened to kill me if I didn't give him $10,000. He said he didn't care how I got it, but that he, he wanted it. Which only confirmed for Tabor that this guy was, was unstable and dangerous. Whenever we found that out, the notion that this was an overdue hiker was dashed pretty quickly. We began to find out more and more about Hilton. He had not had a lot of contact with law enforcement in the past, and, and the contact he had had was minor stuff. A lot of the crimes that he was charged with were misdemeanors. Possession of marijuana. He set fire to something. You know, petty crimes. He had contacts with some of the Forest Service Rangers in the forest. What you doing out here? Well, you're the uh, uh, fourth person to come along. Am I? And ask me that. I guess they called you, didn't they? We talked with them, and they described his behavior as being extremely bizarre, sometimes confrontational, uh, because he was always camping in places that he was not authorized to camp, and they were moving him along. I'm leaving. I'm getting out of here. God Almighty. Probably a couple of hours after Tabor called the GBI, Hilton called John Tabor, looking for money. We traced the telephone call to the Huddle House in Marble Hill, Georgia, west of Blood Mountain. Within minutes, agents descended on the Huddle House, and there was no sign of it. On January 4th, we did get a call that a black lab was believed to be Ella. Meredith's dog had wandered into the Kroger grocery store in Cumming, Georgia, which is about 40 miles south of Blood Mountain. Immediately, agents are dispatched to that location. We were able to get the dog and take it to a veterinarian. We knew Ella had an ID chip in her, and we were able to positively identify that dog as being Ella. There was hope that maybe since Ella was found, that Meredith would be found alive as well. We are thankful that Ella has been found but Meredith is still out there. I appeal to everyone to search their hearts and memories for anything they can remember and do to help us find Meredith. And then Friday afternoon, we get a call from a lady who says, I just got a call from Gary Hilton. I've known him for a while, I haven't seen him in years, but he just called me and he wanted money. She said, don't you know the world's looking for you? And he hung up. She called the tip line, obviously, and gave us the phone number that she had seen on her caller ID. And it is actually a pay phone that is located at a quick trip right in front of the Kroger grocery store where Ella is found. So immediately we're dispatching agents to that location as well, and he is nowhere to be found. Since he appeared to be moving south, we alerted a Metro Atlanta law enforcement to be on the lookout for a white van and Gary Hilton. In the meantime, we began a search of the gas station parking lot and found a dumpster in the back of the lot. And in the dumpster, we found what we hoped we, we wouldn't find. Breaking news tonight, a 24-year-old woman hikes the North Georgia mountains only to vanish into thin air. 
They were looking for this scraggly, toothless man who was seen hiking with her on the trail. Agents received a phone call from an individual who said, hey, I just got off the phone with him. He called asking for money. We got the phone number, and it is actually a pay phone located at a quick trip right in front of the Kroger grocery store where Ella is found. We began a search of the gas station parking lot and found a dumpster. And in the dumpster, we found what we hoped we, we wouldn't find. We found personal belongings of Meredith, bloody clothing, her driver's license, men's boots with blood on them. Everything that she had with her when she had gone up to Blood Mountain was in this dumpster. The blood was so heavy that I knew this was not going to work out like we had hoped. While we're processing that scene, a person in Metro Atlanta, a citizen, calls 911 and says, I think I'm looking at the man y'all are looking for. The cab 911, what's the exact location? I, I have the, uh, the person of interest in that missing woman case is at this uh, Chevron gas station on Ashford Dunwoody. The van is here, the dog is here, the red dog, and I saw the man's face, and I've been watching the news, and I know it's him, I know it's him. He's making multiple trips back to his van and getting out and taking it to a dumpster. I can go take him down if you want. No, sir, stay right there. Okay. At that time, we're sending the world. Oh, I'm just shaking. Is there somebody in route? Yes, sir. Okay, because he looks like he's finishing up. Here comes the cop. Yes. Yes. Police are there? Yes. Yes. <laughs> they got him. And it was while he was trying to wash the blood out of his white Astro van that they finally caught him. One of the first things I asked the officers who took him into custody is, she with him? It's a gut punch when they say, no, he's by himself. Once we found and arrested Gary Hilton, they took him to our headquarters office. And he was very uncooperative. He, he didn't even want to sit up. He didn't even want to walk in. When I walked in, he was laying on the floor, sprawled out, basically just laying there, staring into space. I immediately noticed he had a pretty pronounced fingernail mark into his nose. His hand was swollen. He had some other defensive wounds on his neck, or like claw marks. I was trying anything to get a response from him. The only thing he told us was his Miranda warnings. And, and then he said that he didn't want to talk to us at all after that. Tonight, at around 8 o'clock this evening, Gary Michael Hilton was located. Hope that he's talking and they're getting good information from him. Hopes from Meredith at this hour. Of course, so uh, unharmed. That she walks into that same damn Kroger that her dog did. That's what I want. That night, we worked well into early morning hours of Saturday processing the scene. And we recovered a camera and a tape recorder that Hilton had apparently home videos that he had made of himself. Look, I'm taking a picture of what I need. Come for immortality right here. Good. The videos he shot of himself were so bizarre. He photographed himself with his dog, Dandy. They showed him flexing and mugging for the camera. I've gained 20 pounds in three months, three or four months. 171 pounds. He was very much a narcissist. He made a lot of videos of himself. We got to document it. He's a my boy. He's a my baby. Then they showed him in confrontations because he was on private property or he shouldn't have been where he was. You're the law, man. You are the law. I'm going to check it out. And if it ain't the law and you're wrong, you come talk to me. I'm not talking to nobody. I'm, I'm filing and I'm suing. There was one of him arguing with a Papa John's pizza delivery guy. You tell these guys to quit terror driving. You tell them not to drive five, more than five miles an hour above the limit. We brought his van back to my office and searched it. We found several hundred pieces of evidence in, in the van because he's living in it. High-end camping gear tents and sleeping bags. We also found blood evidence on several things in the van. But 
we continued on because we had Gary Hilton, but we didn't have Meredith. Within the last 15 minutes, a Superior Court judge in Union County has signed a warrant charging Gary Hilton with kidnapping with bodily harm. So you don't believe he's still alive? It does not look favorable for that to be the case. The family really wanted to recover her body because it was believed, although not known for sure, that she was actually dead at that time. Later that Saturday, I said, we got to get this man a lawyer because we can't talk to him. The only way we can communicate to him is through his lawyer. And we don't have Meredith yet. So Sunday morning, he was appointed a lawyer. And I told the, his lawyers, I said, here's everything that we know and have. Who knows what prompted Hilton to cooperate, but he did. And the deal was that if Hilton told them where they could find Meredith, they would take the death penalty off the table. We agreed that it was the right thing to do. The family needed closure. The next afternoon, the prosecutor calls me and says, okay, he's ready to talk to you and tell you where Meredith is. <laughs> Authorities arrest Gary Hilton in the disappearance of Meredith Emerson. They found bloody evidence in his van and in a dumpster and were about to find where he had been keeping Meredith. We actually made a deal with Hilton to take the death penalty off the table if he would take us to her body. So me and the case agent traveled up to the jail, got him out, and he told us where she was. What we'd like to do is, is let you now uh, Tell us where uh, the body is and try to direct us to it the best you can. Okay, we'll be glad to. All right. He drew a map or tried to draw a map where we would find the remains. She was in an area south of Blood Mountain in what's called the Dawson Forest Wildlife Management Area. It's a very rural area, very wooded, nothing but dirt roads run through it. You would go uh, down that road uh, about 50 yards okay. and it's going to be off uh, the south side or the left side of the road the body will be. Okay. Gary Hilton was familiar with this forest. He had been there before, he had camped there before. When he was describing where we would find her, he was very specific. The body will be uh, approximately 40 yards or 120 feet okay. uh, off of that. Uh, south of that is covered by leaves and uh, brush, but not buried. Okay. Is is it wrapped in anything? No, it isn't. Is it is it clothed? Uh, no, it isn't. Is it intact? No, it isn't. Okay. I'll Can you tell, tell us you more about that. Okay. Yes, the head will be missing. He had killed her and decapitated her and taken her head to another location and and had hidden it. Where's the head? The only reason, by the way, the head was removed was forensically. Yeah, right. In other words, the, sure. the hair is, is full of fiber. Sure. He thought that by dismembering her the way he did, that it would be harder to identify her. And the only reason the body is nude is forensics. Okay, sure. for forensics. Okay. See, I didn't even know I was associated with, with this disappearance right. at that time. Right. You see, I didn't find that out till later on the day. I stopped at a gas station, and I am on the front page. He was just very matter-of-fact and very nonchalant. Just, just, just evil. Where would the head be? It's going to be a little hard to find. You're going to need a dog for this, I believe. Can you help us? Well, I'll help you. It was not likely that we could find both scenes without him. So we decided to load him up and take him with us. I apologize to both of you guys. I mean, you know, it's been trying for you. I'm sure these cases are emotionally wrenching yeah. for you. Yeah. But that's your damn job, so. Before he arrived on site, we were able to find Meredith's torso. But there, there was no way I didn't feel like we could find her head without him. He had taken the head and transported it about a quarter mile to a half mile away at another location. 
And so we drove him up to an area where he told us to stop. We got him out of the van and he and I began to walk down this small little woods road in the, in the dark. He was chained, had leg irons on him. He was walking next to me as if he knew exactly where he was going. And all of a sudden he stopped and turned and pointed to a, a bank and told me there would be a, a log on the ground. And on one end of the log there would be more clothing and on the other end would be Meredith. And we were able to find her that way. I went down to the location where the body was. Just the, I guess, weight of it all just floods in. I just fell down on my knees and started crying. I'd never had that reaction in an investigation. It was, it was pretty tough. I, I never wanted to kill somebody as much as I wanted to that night. An autopsy was performed the next day and we learned that Meredith died of blunt force trauma to the head and that she was decapitated post-mortem. I saw the crime scene photos. Those pictures are burned in my brain. It's horrific that this beautiful, vivacious 24-year-old was subjected to this kind of treatment. When we took Hilton down to Dawson Forest that night, he began to tell us about the final moments of Meredith's life and what he had done to her. I thought I knew what evil was. He's pure evil. Sixty-one-year-old Gary Hilton made a deal to lead police to the body of Meredith Emerson. At approximately 7.30 this evening, the body of Meredith Emerson was discovered in a wooded area. When we took Hilton down to Dawson Forest that night, he began to talk about the final moments of Meredith's life and what he had done to her. I'm going to tell you right now, there was never any plan to let her go. Okay. I knew that if I let her go, I would be instantly ID. I'm asking how we got to this point. Why Meredith? Why did you, why did you target her? Well, she's a single girl. She's not hiking with somebody. I should be able to control her physically. I knew it would be easier to establish control over a, a, a female, any female, than it would a male. How did you strike up a conversation with her or whatever? Uh, dogs, you know, uh, people that have dogs, uh, dogs are going to meet. So he approaches her, he tries to keep a conversation going with her, and she basically just walks off and leaves him. So he conceals himself on the way back down the trail that he knows that she'll have to be coming back down. That's where he, he plans to attack her. What did you produce? A knife, a bayonet. The bayonet it? is probably still up there. I, I lost control of both. She fought. And uh, as I read in the paper, she's a martial artist. <laughs> he talks about the fact that all he's wanting is money. He pulls out a, a knife, tells her, look, I'm not going to hurt you. I just want you to move down to your car, give me your card, give me your PIN number, and you can be on your way. She didn't hesitate. She grabbed the knife by the blade and started fighting him. It shocked Hilton. I think it was you probably, one of the one of the GBI said, that little 120-pound girl about probably close to whip your ass. Well, she about did. Meredith was a, a strong young woman with some martial arts training, so he did not have an easy time with her. I had to hand fight her, and I still couldn't get control of her. She would uh, feign or pretend that I was in control and then start fighting again. After he was able to get her under his control and put Meredith in the back of his van, he drove around various locations in North Georgia trying to use ATMs while trying to disguise himself from being seen on the camera with PIN numbers that he had asked her for that were apparently false. Hilton later told us that she, she was just making up PIN numbers and how upset that made him. Four or five times she kept trying to convince you that it would work. That oh, she did work. convince me. Right. She ran me back. I'd come, I'd go try <laughs> like an idiot. 
there was evidence in the van that he was assaulting her to try and get the correct pin number off of her, even to the point of sexually assaulting her. I picture in her mind, if I keep giving the wrong pin number, any second now, the cops are going to come save me. And uh, it's the biggest failure of my career that I did, in my opinion. During her kidnapping, Gary Hilton had basically cleared out the back of the van, but he also had chains that he used to actually padlock her to the seats in the back of the van. And Meredith Emerson was not even able, as far as we can tell, to be able to see out of the van. It had to be, had to be just a horrifying circumstance for her. On the afternoon he killed Meredith, he took her down into the woods and, and uh, tied her to a tree and told her that he was going to let her go in a few minutes. He leaves there and walks back up to his van, his campsite. He told us he got a cup of coffee and a tire iron and went back to Meredith and he said that Meredith had, had said, I thought you weren't coming back. In other words, I thought you were going to leave me here tied to this tree. He said that it seemed like she was relieved that he had come back. She thought she was going home, but she wasn't. I gave her a book to read and uh, everything else there, and I walked up and made as if to uh, unsecure the chain, uh, struck her with the bar. Uh, what, she, what, what bar? It, it was a, a jack handle, uh, a, just a straight jack handle. And then he killed her. He hit her multiple times with a tire tool in the head. Each one would have been fatal. She was still clothed at this time. Eventually her body was found nude and decapitated. I just wanted to expose every, everything to the elements right. rather than keep them back. I poured liquid bleach all over her mm -hmm. to any uh, DNA and I knew, I knew bleach would not destroy fibers, mm -hmm. but I, that any DNA she may have picked up from my clothes. She'd been wearing my clothes for now, what, three days. He is talking to me as if I should be impressed with him. Was this difficult for you at all? As far as, I, I as, far as take her life? Was it difficult at all? It was like a, an out-of-body experience. Okay. It was surrealistic. Like, of course it's surrealistic. Right. Removing your head is just unreal. Right. Unreal. Gary Hilton on the morning of January 31st was indicted in Superior Court. And then at, uh, right after lunch, he pled guilty and was sentenced. Do you now want to enter a plea of guilty? Yes, Your Honor. And how to you plead to the charge of the murder of Meredith Hope Emerson? Guilty, Your Honor. Toward the end of the proceeding, the judge asked the Emersons if they wanted to make a statement, and they both did. So you could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. Meredith was our shining light in our lives. <laughs> and now we are left with a hole in our hearts that will not heal. I believe he is nothing more than a bully and a weak-minded coward who preys on others. He fancies himself a survivalist. Well, anyone can see he's a scared little man on the run. He's the fool who goes through life too ignorant to realize he is a fool. And Meredith has exposed him. Almost nobody can have closure that's real in this situation. But what they did have was a measure of justice in a very quick time, because we had him then, and he was going to pay. I sentence you to spend the remainder of your natural life in prison. It is the intention of the court that you never receive parole. During this investigation, I got phone calls from several different states because they had missing hikers in their forest. Basically said, hey, that's very similar to some cases that we're looking at. It turned out that some of the things started shaping up. We began to get information from out of North Carolina and Tennessee and then Florida. I remember thinking, you know, what is going on? Who do we have here? We realized that what has happened to Meredith Emerson is probably part of a possible serial killer. Mm -hmm. 
And tonight there is growing suspicion that police in Georgia may have a serial killer in custody. During this investigation, I got phone calls from several different states because they had missing hikers in their forest. And that's when I figured out that Gary Hilton's a serial killer. There's no telling how many other victims there are. Once he had told us where Meredith's body was, I asked, this isn't the first time this has happened, is it? He looked at me for a second and almost answered me, but he looked back at his attorney and his attorney said, no, we're just talking about this case in particular. I honestly believe he was getting close to answering me, but uh, the attorney stopped him. By the way, you can tell John Taylor that I'm the one that killed the girl, okay? I'm the one that killed her. When I called him, that girl was alive. It was over a four-hour interview with Gary Hilton after our case was concluded. The purpose of the interview was to see if he would slip up and talk about other victims. And he did in a, in a certain way. Listen, the reason for killing the girl, it was either once you've taken someone, you're either going to kill them or you're going to get caught. It's as simple as that. In my situation, look at me. I got the dog, I got the van, I'm me, I'm famous anyway, <laughs> regardless. And I knew it. I didn't kill them because for any satisfaction. It was distasteful. It was dreadful. Trust me. He referred to those other people in that way that would certainly lead anybody to believe that they're more victims. He really treated the whole aspect of murder as just another day. He even said he, he, he admitted he made mistakes. When you're going out to kill somebody, if you're seen by a single other person on the trail, then no, that, that, that day screwed. And so you get down to the point where, well, it was like Meredith. I had $40 money and several days food. I was going to have to kill somebody in that in that period of time, okay? And when you get down to the bitter end, you ignore all the rules you set, which I did, which got me caught. This is me in the corner right here. This is Hilton. The pure evil of the way his mind works, it's just like, how can this person exist? How can this be a living, breathing thing here on this earth? Wasn't it you that asked me what it's like to cut someone's head off? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it was dreadful, and the only thing you can do is so dreadful that the only thing you can do is go on autopilot. I told you it wasn't real. Right. Okay. On the day before the kidnapping of Meredith Emerson, Gary Hilton was in fact seen on the Appalachian Trail, and he had approached another woman, but when he noticed that she was with other people, he broke off from her. He was apparently searching for someone to be able to take under his control. Blood Mountain is it's a good place to hunt because it's the most used day hiking trail in the state of Georgia. But it's a bad place to hunt in that you a lot, have people. a lot of people. People. So the way you would do it witnesses. So the way you would do it would be to lurk in a blind, so to speak, off the trail, observe with binoculars and lurk. My name's Rob McNeil. I was Gary Hilton's attorney in the Meredith Emerson murder case. As a defense attorney, very rarely do you get a client that tells you the story, the facts, just 100 percent. You know, but with Gary, it wasn't like that at all. He just, this is a matter of fact. This is what happened. This is why I did it. A lot it was just shocking. It just, you just could not stop listening. I remember he, he said one thing that just totally blew my mind was. He said, in hindsight, um, you know, I'd been better off just robbing banks. What do you think? In retrospect, I regret not attempting a bank robbery. I really do. Because all of this shit got me nowhere but caught. Once we got to collaborating with Florida Department of Law Enforcement, we learned that they had a missing victim. Cheryl Dunlop, a nurse and Sunday school teacher, had disappeared. She was the kindest person. Cheryl's body, she was headless, handless. We realized that was probably going to be a serial killer type situation. Mm -hmm.
Welcome back to Real Life Nightmare. I'm Paul Holes. 61-year-old Gary Hilton kidnaps and kills a young college graduate, Meredith Emerson, as she hikes Blood Mountain in Georgia. But just one month earlier, a mom went missing in a Florida national park. The similarities were chilling. In late December 2007, Cheryl Dunlap, a nurse and Sunday school teacher in Tallahassee, Florida, went for a day hike in the Apalachicola National Forest. And she didn't come home. My name is Gloria Tucker. Cheryl Dunlap was my cousin. When Sherry had time to kill, if she was between calls or anything, she would sometimes go to Leon Sinks and she would sit and she would read and read for hours. They've created a venue there where there are hiking trails, there are benches in the shades, and you can go and relax and bird watch. It's a great asset to our community. Sherry was a mom of two boys. She was very proud of them. She had two granddaughters, and she was extra proud of them. Sherry was an RN, a registered nurse. Her life's mission was to help people. She was a member of the River of Life Church. She was a Sunday school teacher. She has done missionary trips to China, to Haiti, to Mexico. She was just a wonderful person. On Saturday morning, December 1st, 2007, Cheryl Dunlap made some phone calls to a couple of friends. She had also indicated she would probably go to Leon Sinks to do some reading. She was seen reading a book there on a park bench by a couple that was taking a hike in the area. And then later that afternoon, she failed to show up for a dinner date. As that event unfolds, she does not show up for church on Sunday morning. Some of her friends from Sunday school tried to reach out to her and get a hold of her, and they couldn't reach her on the phone, but it wasn't anything setting off alarms. Cheryl was a nurse at the Florida State Thaggart health center here on campus at Florida State University in Tallahassee. So on Monday, she did not show up for work. It was as if Ms. Dunlap had just disappeared into thin air. Some friends went to her house as a result of that and found her dog there and her car was gone, so they were very concerned. We were in total bewilderment of what was going on. What do you mean you can't find her? Where is she? She would never, never leave and not tell someone. Subsequent to that, her car had been discovered on the highway right outside of Leon Sinks, beside the road with a flat tire. The Florida Highway Patrol had stopped and checked it. They ran the tag, but there was no alerts out because Cheryl was not reported missing. So it was merely a car with a flat tire, and they left. So when they called the sheriff's office to report her missing, they went back to the sinks, and they found her car. The car was not locked. Sherry would never leave her car unlocked. Her purse and her keys were in the car. The first thing we looked at was the flat tire. It was very obvious that something had intentionally been shoved into the sidewall of that car to flatten that tire. We knew immediately something was drastically wrong. In the meantime, they did a check on Cheryl's bank records. And as it turns out, her ATM card had been used at the same location three times in a period of two and a half days. We went to the bank. They provided us a video of a man that looked like he had just taken gauze and wrapped around his head and used her ATM. I say a man, a person. We couldn't even tell. We were pretty sure it was a man. We got all the exterior footage of vehicles coming and going at the bank. I mean, we were tracking people down and interviewing people, and none of those things panned out. It was just a total mystery. The problem that Cheryl presented for us was she led a pretty wholesome life. She really didn't present a lot of uh, opportunity for us to develop suspects in her world because there weren't any. On December 15, 2007, the Leon County Sheriff's Office received a call 
from a group of hunters in the Apalachicola National Forest. Some hunters observed some buzzards gathering around some mangrove, thick vegetation. Upon closer inspection, the hunters discovered that there was a human torso there. It was immediately apparent to us it, it was a female corpse. It was headless and handless. It was nude. The body was covered in palm fronds, is what we call them. Not to the point you couldn't see it. It was just covered up to disguise it as best could. This was clearly a homicide. The efforts were to prevent identification of who this person was. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement verified that it was, in fact, Cheryl Dunlap's body. To think about what it would take to dismember a human body, I mean, you have to really be sick to accomplish that. Once we discovered Cheryl's body, we were following up on leads and we had some tips, uh, but we still had no real suspect. In the first part of January 2008, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was working a homicide that involved an abduction out of a young lady. In Georgia, the body of missing hiker Meredith Emerson has been found. Police say 61-year-old Gary Hilton led them to her body. It kind of blew up because it was a huge thing in Blood Mountain, Georgia, where this happened to Meredith. These cases were so much alike. I thought, oh my goodness, was it possible that it was it the same person? We began to notice the similarities between the Georgia case and the Tallahassee case. We had a hiker alone in a national forest, seems to have vanished and been abducted. The similarities were, I mean, they were virtually identical. People in our community started to see these newscasts and see photographs of Gary Hilton and his dog. That resulted in an onslaught of tips and sightings. And as it turns out, Gary had been in our community for some time. As those tips started to come in, we would discover campsites in places where Gary Hilton had camped. We would go to each and every one of those sites. We were finding consistent items up to and including the name brand of the dog food that he fed his dog. And so we had a tip from a gentleman that he had run into an older man in the woods, fit Gary Hilton's description to a T. So we go to that campsite and we found what had been covered up with straw and, and hidden fairly well was a small burn pit and it had ashes and debris and ultimately they turned out to be identified as bone fragments from fingers and a skull. The head and hands were incinerated to such a degree that we were not able to conduct DNA testing to actually match the head and hands remains with the torso. But we're very confident that this is not a coincidence. We're very confident that those tied directly back to Cheryl. The condition that the body was left in suggested that there could have been some type of trauma to the head, but the head and hands were so badly burned that we were not able to determine a cause of death for Ms. Dunlap. Decapitating a person and cutting their hands off, it just tells me that this guy's mental capacity is beyond what I can describe, other than just savage and psychopathic. Probably the big turning point for us that we knew that we were onto the person that committed this hideous crime was when our criminal analyst ran Gary Hilton's name in a database, and it turns out Gary Hilton had an encounter with a law enforcement officer in the Apalachicola National Forest that would put him in our community in and around the time that Cheryl Dunlap's disappearance occurred. It was all beyond coincidence at that juncture. We knew Gary Michael Hilton was responsible for this. What he did to Meredith Emerson, he did to Cheryl Dunlap. Cheryl Dunlap went for a day hike in the Apalachicola National Forest. She didn't come home. A couple of weeks later, some hunters saw some buzzards circling. They went to the area and located the remains of Cheryl Dunlap. She had been decapitated, her hands had been cut off and set on fire. It was just a total mystery. Up until Gary Michael Hilton got on our radar as a suspect. That man is the most evil thing. It's mind-boggling that, that someone could hurt such a kind, loving individual. Gary Michael Hilton was arrested in Georgia on the case related to Meredith Emerson. And he had with him a van with mountains of evidence in it. 
We found Cheryl Dunlap's DNA on a pair of boots, hiking boots that Mr. Hilton was attempting to discard at the time he was apprehended in Georgia. We were aware that in Meredith Emerson's case, she was held captive for a period of days, chained up in this guy's van and sexually assaulted. I think the evidence suggests that that is the same thing that happened to Cheryl Dunlap. We were able to find some DNA on her thigh area that was a match to Mr. Hilton. Gary Michael Hilton had tried to rape her at least two times. The mitigator for the defense told me what had happened. And then what he did was he promised her that if she would go down and tie herself to the tree, then he would think about letting her go. And what he did was when she turned around and walked towards the tree, he shot her in the head and killed her. He couldn't face her. In both the murder of Meredith Emerson and the murder of Cheryl Dunlap, we had a financial motive. In our case, Ms. Dunlap had apparently given up her pen because the suspect was able to successfully withdraw money from Ms. Dunlap's account. We compared the photographs of those ATMs to the ones that we had developed in Georgia, and it was obviously the same person, no doubt. Gary Michael Hilton confiscated $700 out of Sherry's account, but $700 compared to Sherry's life? That's nothing. A bayonet was found in connection with the Meredith Emerson case on Blood Mountain. That bayonet was significant to my case because the tool mark examiner that looked at Cheryl Dunlap's tire that had been punctured was able to say, this is the actual tool that was used to puncture Cheryl Dunlap's tire. Police are now looking into whether Hilton may be linked to other hiking murder cases in North Carolina. We had a meeting this afternoon with uh, investigators and prosecutors from North Carolina regarding a double homicide. Well, before Cheryl Dunlap in North Carolina, an elderly couple, John and Irene Bryant had gone hiking in a national forest in Transylvania County. And they did this all the time. But their children lived in other places, their adult children, and one of them noticed uh, and heard from mom and dad. John and Irene Bryant were married for 58 years after meeting each other on a blind date. They had four children and 11 grandchildren. The pair loved the outdoors, and in their retirement, they hiked almost weekly. Sadly, their last hike would result in an unthinkable tragedy. They found Irene Bryant near her car, near this national forest. She had been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. Mr. Bryant was not at the scene. John Bryant was found in, in February after he and his wife had disappeared in October. John Bryant's body was recovered in the Nantahala National Forest. He was shot. They connected them also to Hilton because someone had used their ATM card and withdrawn $300 from their bank account. Both the build, the mannerisms, everything was clearly matching up to Gary Hilton. Actually, the first DNA sample that we removed from the van wound up being Mr. Bryant's DNA. He had a method of operation, an MO, and it was to find people who he perceived as weak, who might be a money bank for him. You know, it could have been any of us. I'm a father of two daughters and a husband and, and uh, you know, uh, can't imagine. And that ain't fake, I apologize. He doesn't just kill them, he mutilates their body. Cheryl Dunlap, like Meredith Emerson, he dismembered her. He thought that that would make it harder for police to collect evidence that would connect him to them. He can say he's trying to be careful all he wants, but he just liked it. Gary Hilton may not be regarded as highly as Ted Bundy was in terms of being a serial killer but he's certainly on the same level. Ted Bundy had all kind of props. You know, crutches one day, arm and a cast the next. Gary Hilton's prop was his dog. He's a my boy. He's a my baby. He used Dandy as his approach mechanism, 
kind of an icebreaker with Meredith to gain confidence. And I'm sure that he did that with all his victims. Pump for immortality right there. Good. The camera's right there. Hilton could turn on the charm when he wanted to be. He'd get stopped by a ranger and he'd, you know, chat him up and act like a guy that was just living his life in his van. What you doing out here? Well, you're the uh, fourth person to come along, am I? I'm leaving. I'm getting out of here. God almighty. He jokes around. He's acting very bizarre, but he doesn't present in some of those situations, you know, I'm, I'm crazy dangerous. Maybe just crazy, but maybe not both. Hey, I love you. Mr. Hilton, you take care. His IQ is extremely high, so he's able to communicate very well. Lawyers and everyone else ask me constantly, how come you're so seemingly intelligent? The reason I'm so seemingly intelligent is that I, alone amongst almost anyone, including you dudes, have time to actually stop and think about things. During this investigation, I talked to a, a lawyer, and he told me about a, a movie that he, the lawyer, had participated in making. I'm a hunter, Barbara. What's the challenge? And he said Gary Hilton had consulted on that movie. The movie was that we would take uh, women, bring them, them over to the mountains, and then hunt them down like prey. I was thinking, that's kind of like what he did now. <laughs> Gary Hilton told us that he would have continued to kill people had we not caught him and uh, there's no doubt that he would have. I'm um, Samuel Rail, and I was uh, Gary's attorney for a number of cases, and then also his close acquaintance. Actually, Gary was my very first client. He was there as a small-time crook uh, doing charitable work, except there's no charity. It's for Gary. He was a scam artist. He would call people on the phone, tell them that he's with the JCs or he's with the Shriners and he's putting on a circus for the kids and would their company like to contribute. He'd go by and pick up the check and cash it and that's how he made his living until, you know, he got arrested for it a few times. That's right. Bravo, right, buddy. Right away. The 1995 movie Deadly Run went straight to video. It portrays a serial killer who preyed on women he set loose in the woods. The plot, the film's producer claims, came from this man, Gary Michael Hilton. I did this movie, Deadly Run, but I think for Gary, apparently it turned out to be a trial run. The movie was that we would take women, as beautiful as we could find them, and then uh, bring them, them over to the mountains, and then hunt them down like prey. That's what got him so excited to be part of this whole movie. Meeting me can be dangerous to your health. <laughs> I think Nancy's been abducted and she's most probably dead. I think the guy that did it to her has done it before to a whole lot of other women. The idea was that it would be a shock for the police to realize that they were dealing with a serial killer. Gary thought that would be a very good idea. He actually picked the spot, the location for the movie at this secluded cabin. He did. He knows North Georgia like the back of his hand. He looked around and found really what was a, a perfect place, just a little uh, cabin out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how anybody finds it. He knew how. The cabin was located near Cleveland, Georgia. 30 miles to the southwest, the mutilated body of Meredith Emerson was discovered. It seems pretty unbelievable. Somebody who helped produce a movie about a serial killer turns out to be a serial killer. Bizarre. Right? How did someone who I knew and knew so well all of a sudden turn out to be such a person? At the time I knew him, anybody would want to meet him and be around him. He was very gracious, paid close attention to his body. He always worked out. He was always up there in the mountains. He was always outdoorsy. I'm surprised that it'd be a serial killer 
But I'm not surprised because he didn't have a screw loose. He had several screw looses. He was a fellow with a lot of problems, which is why I really wanted to help him out. Growing up, Gary Hilton, his mother divorced his father, and there was an instant when Gary was 14 years old, and he thought that his stepdad was mistreating his mother. So Gary was able to get from a friend a handgun one day when he was arguing with his stepfather. He threatened to shoot him, and Gary did. He didn't kill him, but he shot his stepfather when he was 14. He was charged with a juvenile offense then because he was so young. Later on, he joined the military, was stationed in Germany for a while uh, at a base that he said handled nuclear weapons. He had been discharged because he was thought to be becoming schizophrenic. He would use that kind of language, you know, military language, when he would talk about when he would go to the mountains, call them operations, and he would say he was hunting people. Blood Mountain is it's a good place to hunt because it's the most used day hiking trail in the state of Georgia. He married three times. He actually, during one of those marriages, bought a home. Then, all of a sudden, he's homeless, lives in a van in the forest. His criminal history was just a lot of run-ins with law enforcement. He get arrested and charged with possession of drugs, or he was trespassing. He had dozens and dozens of those experiences, but none really serious enough to send him to prison for a long time. That's what made law enforcement wonder if he had other murders in his history, because how do you go from drug crimes or trespassing to serial killing? You don't, that's a big jump. At the time that we arrested Gary Hilton, he was 61 years old. It's hard to believe that somebody 61 just woke up one morning and says, I'm gonna go kill people like this. It's unlikely that there are no other victims. I am 99.9% .9 sure that Gary Hilton has committed more than the four murders that we can prove. To this day, they're still looking to see if he might have done more. Rosanna Milani was one of the, of the names that came up. There were just so many similarities that the question is, was it Gary Hilton or who was it? Authorities were able to connect four murders to Gary Hilton. Yet another case with strange similarities emerges. A young woman had mysteriously disappeared from a small North Carolina mountain town. Authorities were now wondering if she also fell victim to this serial killer. My name is Luz Miliani. I'm the mother of Rosanna Miliani. My daughter was a very, very energetic girl. I call her my earthquake because the moment she arrived, you knew that she was here. I'm the father of Rosanna Miliani. Rosanna was very artistic. She was creative. She travels a lot. She loves to go different places. On December 7, 2005, Rosanna Miliani traveled to Bryson City, North Carolina. In the afternoon of that same day, Rosanna vanished into thin air. No one's seen or heard from her since then. It is a true mystery. Bryson City, North Carolina is a small town. It's at the doorway to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Fresh air, clean water, and nice people. At the time of Rosanna's disappearance, she was 29 years of age. There is no doubt, no doubt in my mind, that there is someone who took Rosanna. Rosanna had a target on her back. When you take a young female who is walking around a downtown area and pulling luggage, that is an indicator to a person who might have criminal intentions. And was it Gary Hilton or was it someone else? The last time Rosiana spoke with her father was on December 7th at 7.41 a.m when she made the phone call from her room at the Ramada Inn in Cherokee, which is now the Cherokee Grand Lodge. She greeted me, hello, daddy. 
Uh, I'm in North Carolina. Why are you doing that? Well, I'm just, this is beautiful here and I wanted to come here. I'll be home soon. I will keep in touch. Her father reached out to law enforcement because they were always in contact and then she just dropped off the face of the earth. We immediately launched an investigation trying to find out and trace Rosanna's last movements. We found that she was in downtown Bryson City shopping. Some of the places that she went to was a local hair salon. At that time, she made statements that she was there to go hiking. Rosiana did not have her own vehicle while she was here. She put some of her stuff in storage. The storage unit that Rosiana had had been prepaid for a month. We believe that she had full intentions of staying here for that month. Also, we found that she had went to a local bank and was going to open up a checking account. She had plans. After her disappearance, the National Park Service and also the U.S. Forest Service was notified. They were looking for her, but she was never seen in any of the campgrounds. Nor had they found any property such as clothing, personal belongings. They had not seen any trace of Rosanna. It had been a period of time after Rosanna went missing so I, I reached out to the local news media to see if they would run another article. They willingly agreed to help out. So just within a few days after the article came out in the local Bryson City newspaper, I received a phone call from a lady who worked in a local downtown thrift store. And she told me, this has haunted me. The person who I am sure and certain that was in my store was in fact Rosanna. I do not think there's one doubt in my mind that I seen her. Even after all these years, I might get mixed up on a few things, but I know that I saw her. The date that she observed Rosanna in her store was in fact the date that Rosanna went missing. It sticks out in her mind for that day because it resembled one of her family members and actually thought that it was her when she came into the store. She also said that she was with uh, an older male that was in his 60s. They had come into the store together. The store clerk told me that the male appeared to be very guarded over Rosanna. It was like he had her under his spell. She acted to me like that the man was in control and she should do what he told her to do. The store clerk also advised me that the male individual stated that he was a preacher who often traveled from campground to campground preaching. The description of the male was in his early to mid 60s. He was a white male um, and she also felt like he was wearing a hairpiece. This is the initial sketch drawn by the forensic sketch artist. There were some similarities to Gary Hilton. Looking at that composite kind of makes me remember the photographs we got it at the ATMs. Even though he was wearing a mask or a homemade mask, it was obviously him. And, and, and that's close. That's real close. He's got the same hairline, the same brow line, the same nose. Also on the descriptors that the store clerk gave was that, that the gentleman that was in there appeared to be balding. Gary Hilton was also balding. Do you think it's possible that Gary Hilton was the man that came into the thrift shop? I not only think it's possible, I know he's the man that came in the thrift store. And I broke out in, in a sweat. I was that close to a murderer. During the investigation, we were able to confirm Gary had been in our area the time of the disappearance. This area is full of hiking trails campgrounds, areas that, that he frequented to where he could get control of his victims. 
John Bryant was an elderly victim of Gary Hilton. The area to where Mr. Bryant's body was located in the Nantahala Forest is adjacent to Bryson City. There were just too many similarities. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation did determine that those links were credible. So it was decided that, that we needed to conduct an interview with Gary Hilton. This is about a lady by the name of Rosanna Miliani. Okay, I know who you're talking about. You look into his eyes and you could tell that Satan was running his soul. Yeah. On December 7, 2005, Rosiana Miliani was in Bryson City, North Carolina on a hiking trip. Since then, she has vanished. We have no idea where she's at. One of the angles that we looked at was could Gary Hilton, the known serial killer, have anything to do with Rosiana's disappearance? You heard about Gary Hilton and saw his picture you thought that that could be the yeah, guy? Yeah, I did. Right off the bat, the first look, I have no doubt in my mind that this is the man that came into the thrift store. After the sketch was completed, there were some similarities to Gary Hilton. I do think the sketch will be the biggest clue that you have to find this lady. To this day, the person that the store clerk reported seeing has never come forward. We've not had another person call and say, I think this is such and such. We have nothing. Early on during the investigation of Gary Hilton, I was notified that there were two unknown DNA samples that were located in Gary Hilton's van. Meredith's blood was there, John Bryant's blood was there, Cheryl Dunlap's blood was there, and there's other blood that's there that suggests that there's other victims. DNA for Rosiana has been compared to other unknown DNA samples, and we've not received any positive connections between them. Even after all these years, we don't have any evidence linking anyone to the disappearance of Rosiana. It is a true mystery. One of the things that, that we had decided that needed to be done was myself and Special Agent Shannon Ash traveled down to the prison in Florida where Gary was being held and interviews were conducted with him. This is about a lady by the name of Rosanna Miliani. Okay, I know who you're talking about. There's a couple reasons I want to talk to you about this. Uh, well, it fits my M.O. Other than just thinking that's one creepy SOB, he was very cooperative. Uh, but on the other hand, when you looked into his eyes, you could tell that Satan was running his soul. He talked about everything. He went over other victims, how he did it, why he did it, very graphic details. One of the primary reasons I did these abductions was to rape the women. Even though I had fantasies of killing and raping women, the killing part was, was just to keep from getting caught. Sure. I did not like the killing. I usually didn't even like to fantasize about the killing. I would put that out of my mind. When we started talking about our case, he had done his homework. He knew what we were coming down to uh, talk to him about. Rosanna, on December 7, 2005, was seen with a male, a white male. Yes, yes. I, and she, she a composite. So that's the second yeah. reason we wanted to come. It's similar to you. Is that you? Oh, no, no. Listen, well, let's cut to the chase right now. Okay. okay, listen. The description I got was he was 50 to 60 years old. Okay, not only that, she was a hiker. I was a big time hiker. Yeah. She d disappeared during a hiking trip under some circumstances. My victims were all taken in the woods. Okay, it all fits together. But listen, it fits me, but it wasn't me. Okay. That's one thing Gary Hilton will do. He will deny it until you can show him that you've got enough evidence that it's going 
It's going to get him. I've got to admit, I wasn't much of a serial killer. Okay, I should have had a long career, and I should have killed lots of people. And I just f***ed up. I, I committed. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. It, it, it is. How many were there? Four. Two brides. There was uh, Meredith uh, Emerson and uh, Cheryl Dunlap down here. That was it. After the first interview, we felt like we had enough of a rapport that we asked Gary if he would be willing to, to take a polygraph exam. He said he would. We then flew back to Florida with our polygraph examiner, and we got the results from the polygraph exam. Rosanna Miliani traveled to Bryson City, North Carolina, to do some hiking, and in the afternoon of that same day, Rosanna vanished into thin air. Was Rosanna's disappearance connected to the serial killer Gary Hilton? Gary was more than willing to take the polygraph. He was asked point blank questions about the disappearance. After it was over, the polygraph examiner noted that uh, he could not find anything that would lead him to believe that Gary was not being honest. There was no deception noted during the polygraph. Though Gary Hilton passed the polygraph test, they are not 100% accurate and are used just as a tool. It is possible he could have been deceptive. We're not saying that Hilton is innocent or guilty, but there's no clear connection. I mean, it's a real mystery. Gary Hilton is the only person to date that, that we have even suspected or thought of a person of interest. Right now, we do not have anything concrete that we could link Gary back to her disappearance. But with that being said, that does not mean that you know if, if we get a call or we get a tip that we're not going to jump right back on it. We want to know the truth. We want to know where she's at. I believe that Gary Hilton has some skeletons in his closet that's not been revealed yet. There's someone out there that definitely knows what happened to Rosanna. Living the way it is now without knowing, I think it's a torture. It's very difficult. Every single minute. Jesus in my mind. I'm 75 years old and I don't like to die without knowing what happened to my daughter. I need to find out. I need to put a conclusion to that. It has been a nightmare for Rosanna's family not knowing what happened to their daughter. I really plead anyone to help me up solve this problem. My daughter has been lost for so many years. The number that you have to call is 828-488-0159 at the Swan County Sheriff's Office. Rosanna Miliani's disappearance remains a mystery. To this day, authorities still have not excluded the possibility that Gary Hilton may have been involved. It is ordered and judged that you, Gary Michael Hilton, be sentenced to death for the murder of Cheryl Dunlap. On February 21st, 2011, the jury unanimously recommended the death penalty for the murder of Cheryl Dunlap. I was thrilled that a woman could be the one that brought his end in some regard. Gary Michael Hilton is currently on death row at Union CI. We are still in the middle of an appeal, so no date has been set for him to be executed. I look forward to learning the date of Gary Hilton's execution in Florida, and you better bet I'll, I'll be there.
这不是景点区，这是奔景点区的路子上。海鲜溜石是什么意思？吃的？你这让我多少钱？来海边上肯定得吃点海鲜啊！怎么多少也得吃吃点。Stuff we said. That- 